Hello, I'm Glenna Barlow, Curator of Education here at the Columbia Museum of Art, and I'm standing here in our current exhibition, Visions from India. Before we go any farther, I want to be sure to thank our sponsors, without whom this exhibition and these programs would not be possible. And a special thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities, who supported this program and many others. And finally, I want to be sure to thank our members. Thank you to each of you for supporting our work. We could not do any of these programs or put on these exhibitions without your help, so thank you. It is my distinct pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Carrie Lucinda Brown, Professor of Art History at the Savannah College of Art and Design and a specialist in South Asian and Himalayan art. I've had the privilege of knowing Carrie personally for years, and I'm delighted that you'll be able to benefit from her vast knowledge and experience about Indian art and culture. Carrie earned her PhD in art history at Virginia Commonwealth University and has traveled extensively throughout South Asia, earning numerous grants to conduct research throughout the region, including a Fulbright Fellowship in Nepal. The artwork in Visions from India is stunning, and I do hope that if you haven't already and you're able to, that you'll come see it in person. But we often see only one or two works from each of the artists featured in the show, and each of them are so prolific with hugely diverse bodies of work. So I'm particularly thrilled that you'll get a chance to see other aspects of these artists and what they're exploring in their work. So without further ado, Dr. Carrie L. Brown presents Icons for a New Generation. Hi, my name is Carrie Brown. Before I get started today, I wanna to thank Glenna Barlow for the invitation to come speak with you. And I also wanna thank the greater curatorial team and staff at the Columbia Museum of Art for putting such a wonderful exhibition together. I look forward to our talk today. Um, and part of my interest in this topic isn't necessarily as a scholar of contemporary art, but as a scholar of greater um, India and greater South Asia, both in terms of artistic, architectural and cultural traditions. And part of what I wanna to do today in our talk is think about how in the most recent incarnations of art in India, how artists are really trying to navigate issues of modernization, globalization, transportation, movement, migration, and how artists working in the field today are navigating those issues. As I said, as a scholar of South Asian art, I'm really interested in issues of identity and I'm interested in issues of how um, iconic forms become codified, become used in contemporary society, both in terms of high art and popular culture. And so what I plan to do today is walk you through um, my own exploration and attempts to understand these new materials um, as we work towards um, an understanding of what's happening in contemporary India today. Now, many people, when thinking of art in India and Indian culture, some of the most iconic uh, works that come to mind are the Taj Mahal in terms of architecture and personas like Gandhi. And it's these iconic forms that are really embedded and deep seated in our appreciation of India our appreciation of greater South Asia, South Asian art and architecture, and the rich cultural heritage of the region. But one of the issues with this, and one of the problematic um, uh, concepts that I'm gonna address today is this like continued legacy of these iconic forms and this sort of framing of India as a monolithic identity, as a monolithic feature. Now in the 19th century, there's several artists that traveled to India and document um, Indian art and architecture, Indian culture during the British colonial period. Most notably, um, the American Orientalist painter, Edwin Lord Weeks, um, went on several tours of South Asia and Persia. Among his uh, recordings are these really lovely renderings that are very idyllic, um, almost these romanticized visions of India that show, in this case, the Taj Mahal from 1883, um, the lovely gardenscapes that were there in the 19th century, but this sort of monumental piece of architecture in the background, hidden by those botanical features, but really this sort of lovely somber uh, moment. And it's this sort of pervasive view of these spaces and places of India that have their 
roots in late 18th, early 19th century um, artists and painters that continue through the long 19th century and into the 20th century that are sustained. Um, this is a woodblock print from Japanese artist Yoshida who conveys the same sense of um, the moment, this sort of perfect architectural structure um, we here have figures framed in the foreground, and again, those gardenscapes in the middle ground. But it gives us this sort of idyllic sense of India, this forever permanent architectural masterpiece, the container of all things um, tangible, the container of this majestic, perfect place. We also see it in a few other of um, Weeks's works, his paintings. Um, these are the Ghats uh, in Mathura where we have people approaching these riverscapes, um, bathing, making offerings. We have these lovely boats, um, these grand vistas in the background, but these lovely renderings of this India that's everlasting that really remains in the imaginations of, of people moving forward. And when we enter the 20th century, we're gonna see these same ideas continue, even uh, when we get to periods of, of independence in 1947, uh, the turmoil of partition and then beyond. These are still very vivid um, imaginations of India and the spaces and places and people of India. Now, another one of um, Weeks's works, we can see here the temple at Amritsar from 1890. Again, another very clear work where we have um, this lovely scene showing individuals in the landscape seated around and among the temple spaces, um, but it's very idyllic. And it's this kind of uh, imagination of India, it's this kind of understanding of India, these iconic spaces that really shape um, the greater psyche and remembrance and imagination of India. We see this continue even today. These are screenshots that I took of tours to India um, that are taking place now, that are offered now um, on the internet. We see an emphasis on the Taj Mahal, rivers, river spaces, river towns, um, exploring uh, great architecture and spaces. This also continues um, even within tour packages offered in India targeting Indian nationals and uh, expatriates living abroad, coming back home. Again, it's the same kind of um, centering of this sort of architectural splendor, the grandeur of this sort of rich visual history, um, the spirituality of these places. And it almost becomes a stereotypical trope of how we need to understand and then um, inform one's understanding of India and Indian spaces. But part of this is really situated on an India of the past that does exist. It does have its space and it does have its presence, but there's been tremendous changes over the last 40 years impacting both um, greater economies in India and then pushing India onto a global stage. So in this map, we can see the growth of the GDP of India from 1980 all the way to present day. So there's a, um, particularly from the mid 90s until about 2010, there was almost a doubling of profit um, and uh, this sort of growth of, of development in India. We see a growth of um, a rising middle class. We see a flowering of uh, billionaires in India. And so there's a tremendous amount of change during this time. And there's also change of urban spaces um, and rural spaces as well in India. Part of this is also impacted by a large diaspora population, a population that has left India um, that lives abroad um, for various reasons. Some of those are for migration to other spaces, for jobs, job opportunities. Um, we see migrant populations continuing to expand uh, even until to recent years. Uh, this is two um, 
diagrams um, from the Times of India that talks about this um, from an article in March of 2018 that shows sort of where Indians abroad are going, how those numbers have changed, those destinations. So we see a tremendous spread of culture, um, uh, cultural identity, and then sort of living in multiple places yet still having a connection to India. And so all of this movement, all of this migration, whether it's for jobs or it's for labor opportunities in the Middle East, in other countries in Asia, we see um, a lot of influence then on the relationship to and the relationship with um, India as a nation and sort of the remembrance and memory of that place. But it's also impacted by that larger system of sort of that constructed fantasy um, of that colonial, idyllic, romanticized place as well. So all of these things are, are working together. As I mentioned before, the diaspora movement and the movement of people isn't just um, for jobs and job opportunities, it's also for students traveling abroad um, for education and for school. And there's been a tremendous uptick of that um, between the years 2010 and 2015. And in part, a lot of that is based on this economic prosperity and want and desire for further economic opportunities. And so what we're gonna see throughout these, um, this time, at the same time as we're having this economic prosperity and these economic developments, we're seeing that India <coughs> in Indian art um, and the works produced from this period, late 90s, throughout the early 2000s, and then into the last decade, um, they're responding to these movements. And so there's a push and a pull and a tension of trying to examine these spaces and places, not just India in the global world, and thinking about um, India in this global economy, but within India as well, this divide between urban and rural spaces, high-end modern shopping spaces. Um, this is a DLF center, um, city center mall in New Delhi on the left. And then on the right, just down the road in Old Delhi, we have traditional gullies and shops. Um, obviously this is the tire market, right? And they're coexisting. This navigation of spaces and places is needing to be um, uh, explored through artists and their work, trying to understand a new growing urban society, a wealthy society, yet still navigating issues of poverty, issues of migration, um, issues of urban and rural. But in many ways, these are the similar issues going on around the world at the same time. We're gonna see a lot of uh, artists that we talk about today, trying to navigate this issue of um, tradition, icons, belief systems, and spaces in the works that we're going to look at. And when we're going to talk about this, just very quickly, you know, we, we need to think about, you know, the, the kind of rural and urban divides that India is facing today are no different than the urban and rural divides facing America, for example, right? Different areas of the country have different belief systems, different practices, um, and in many cases in India, different language traditions. So part of what we're gonna see artists doing in their contemporary works is coming to terms with these various issues of identity, various issues of, of space and place, borders, boundaries, and migration. And we're gonna see that India isn't just traditional architecture or traditional um, way station for all of these lovely, rich uh, visual history of works that go back nearly um, 4,000 years, but they're part of a vibrant living tradition that continues to modernize and is part of a growing urban society as well. It's not either or, it's all. And it's that navigation of those spaces, issues of hybridity, issues of industrialization, um, where artists are really trying to navigate what this means for them. And that's where we're gonna find our time over the next um, 40 minutes or so. Now, when we think about icons, and we think about iconic imagery in India, one of the things and one of the personas that we cannot ignore is Gandhi. Um, this painting 
uh, which is acrylic and fabric on canvas by Jagannath Panda um, from 1970, or excuse me, from 2008, um, really shows us this lovely rendering of a statue of Gandhi in a square. Um, we have this composition that is darkened. We have this night sky um, in the background and what appears to be a bronze image of Gandhi. Now there's multiple images of Gandhi in India, multiple images of Gandhi around the world, and it's difficult to place this one exactly. Um, but we have a lot of similarities to sort of this typical rendering of an older Gandhi um, wearing his khadi cloth um, with his iconic glasses um, raised up on a pedestal. The platform that he's on um, shows him wearing sandals. And when we start to look at the details, some of the images that pop here include the, the birds flying around a statue. Um, and then when we look closer, we can see that it looks like sort of dead decaying plants along the bottom and sort of scattered around the form as if they're sort of floating in the wind. And then in the very background, we have this modern urban space. These are not traditional Indian homes. We have um, sharp uh, lines, the use of light, and then this dark sky. And then, and then on the left side of Gandhi, we have a lantern. It's a really engaging work. Obviously, we're dealing with one of the iconic forms um, in Indian culture. However, the more we think about this sort of form and his um, placement in this larger scape, it becomes clear that um, the sort of birds and detritus are also expressing this idea that this form is there. It's sort of worn, um, it's possibly forgotten. If we look at the feet and the clustering of forms around the base, right, we can read those elements. We can see the birds picking through the sort of tumbleweed of forms and of botanical materials. But there's an idea of loss here, right? Um, a Gandhi of the past, is he being forgotten now in the future, right? Are we letting go of those ideals? Have we forgotten the point? And so it's a really fascinating rendering of Gandhi. Um, and it's really, um, uh, calling attention to some of these visual elements that are very clearly portrayed globally. So this is a statue by Philip Jackson from 2015 of Mahatma Gandhi, which is installed in Parliament Square in London. And it's very similar to the, the painted rendering we have from 2008. Um, we have this iconic image of Gandhi and his form in a square. And so we're really Right, calling attention to this very typical um, presentation of Gandhi. However, what we see with um, Panda's work is that, you know, there's a questioning of whether or not this um, idealism and these belief systems are sustained and if they're maintained, right? We have those elements around the form at the butt base of the painting, right? Um, it, tells us that the work isn't being maintained, right? That the form, this location isn't something that's um, visited often, right? There's a remembrance here, right? Of Gandhi and his work, but it's also questioning that sustained attention to his ideals. And so it's, 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 a, it's a lovely piece to consider in this sort of greater composition. Um, one of Pandey's other works, that also speaks to these issues of migration and movement of spaces and people um, is The Migrant from 2009, which is a, an, another painting where we see a deer with large antlers. Um, there's texture and decoration on the breast of the animal. And then we have more birds um, in the antlers. But what I love about this and what strikes me um, is the use of the urban within this work. Um, if we look in the foreground, we have this red uh, bar painted at the bottom and it's actually an I-beam. And then in the background as a blur, as if it's a traffic moving in that space, 
um, you can see what appears to be a car and then more buildings and more spaces. And then we have this sort of stoic deer in, in this sort of foreground space. So for me, the migrant is referencing the deer's body in the space, this idea of something from a rural space, a space of nature now in this urban environment that seems out of place. Right, the car that we're looking at um, is most typically or most likely um, a uh, blurry detail of um, a car called a Hindustani ambassador. So the Hindustan ambassador car is pretty iconic um, in India as a taxi and a family car. And what we see with this inclusion here is this a remembrance of the urban right, that we're dealing with this space. And one of the issues in India is the migration of Indians within India from rural spaces to city centers, most typically um, Delhi and the um, areas around Delhi in the north, the northwestern part of India. In the southwestern coast, it's the areas of Mumbai and the areas around those hubs. And then we have other centers um, in the south and not so many in the east, but still a migration to those larger capital cities of those regions. These regions and this development has led to an influx of, of people from various parts of India um, coming to those cities and coming into those spaces. And so one of the ways that we can think about you know, this idea of migration, it's not always going to be migration on a global scale, it's migration on, on a local scale and on an, at a local level. And so this idea that as these urban spaces spread, they're also enveloping those very rural areas around those cities to help for expansion, to help for sprawl. And so it's the meeting of those um, rural spaces with urban spaces and juxtaposing those areas and thinking about that conflict. With Wanda's work, we get also a lot of detail on um, elements of the body and the form. And we have this lovely rendering of a deer um, and the birds and the antlers. And so it's this lovely juxtaposition of nature and urban. And it's very striking. Those concepts and those approaches when we're thinking about contemporary Indian art, um, we'll see the, that those iconic elements that are nods to sort of core cultural elements and cultural traditions are things that we're going to see a lot of. Um, when we talk about the Hindustani, Hindustan Motors Ambassador, um, this car was in production until just a few years ago. Um, it was the primary taxi you'd see around India. Um, it was also a standard family car. It was easy to take care of. They were sort of rock solid, um, strong workhorses of cars. And they really became iconic visually on the landscape. Um, but those have been filtered out in recent years with the influx, not of Indian produced cars, but of cars from the international market. And so it's really become sort of a, a symbol of nationalism and heritage, but also I'm sure for, for a lot of artists and individuals working, it's that nostalgia of the past making their way into, into some works. Now this idea of movement and migration is also picked up by artists like KP Reggie, who is, um, is from Kerala. Um, this work, which is in the exhibition, um, is titled To Move the Mountain and it dates to 2008. Again, during this period of vast expansion, um, international movement and then internal migration within India. And what I love about this work and what I think is really striking here is this idea of, of movement, right? Because we have a vehicle, um, but also the objects carried are very symbolic. Um, they have symbolic meanings, symbolic messages, but they're not always clear. Um, this particular work is part of a larger series. Here's another example of a larger format of acrylic on canvas where you can see, again, another rendering of this same kind of, of mode. So in this larger scope of works um, by KP Reggie, we see this idea of the things that must move or be moved to go from one place to another, 
right? Um, in some instances, you're moving an entire household. In other instances, you can't take anything with you. So it's this varying interpretation of what we have and what's going on. But the fact that this vehicle on either side has these prongs, which connect it to another vehicle, also gives us, us an impression of a train and multiple cars on a train. Now, all kinds of transportation are popular in India, trains, trucks, buses, bicycles. Um, but it's this idea of sort of this migration and togetherness that this is a continuation, that it will be continued, that it's this um, movement from here to there is a lot of what's going on here in these, these works, navigating sort of the movement of people and things. Um, the movement of identity too. And so I don't doubt that a lot of the elements that we have in the visual forms located on the tops of this particular um, work um, on the left and on the right in both examples are statements that tell a very particular story. Um, some of it seems out of place. And I think some of Reggie's works are really interesting because there's an absurdity um, that is fostering a curiosity as to what's going on. On the left, we have a rooster, some rooster's um, uh, uh, feet. Uh, we have a crutch with a fake foot. Uh, there's a dog, and then there's a, 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 a feature that looks sort of like a tree branch. All of that uh, has no sort of qualifiable iconographic meanings or messages. But to me, you know, these are speaking to the artist's own impressions and remembrances and memories. When we have more objects to work with, again, we have more stories. Um, but all of these are speaking to this idea of migration and sort of that everything is coming with someone um, as they move and sort of the things that they take with them. And when we get to these spaces, right, and we think about the movement of people and places in India, it is very typical, um, such as the photographs that you have here as an example, to see multiple people crammed into a Jeep with sort of one bag with them or just what they have on their bodies moving with them or going with them. It could be just across town, it could be across the state, it could be across the country. But there's this um, sense of movement of people in vast volumes of people to various spaces. And so when I'm looking at Reggie's paintings and when I'm looking at his works, I'm reminded by my own travels in India. Um, I lived in rural India for a few years. And so I've seen these um, moments, I've seen these spaces and I've seen the things that people take with them or cannot take with them as they move, if it's um, temporary or permanent. So it becomes a very engaging conversation about the status of people and communities, right? What's happening to a community even when people move and people migrate from one place to another? How does that translate to the new place? And so we see other artists um, also working through these ideas of movement and migration. Um, Rina Saini Kalat is an artist who was born in Delhi and now lives and works in Mumbai. And I've been fascinated by her um, map drawings uh, that you see here. So this is untitled from 2011. This is an original installation um, when it was shown in Sweden. And you can see that it's a large installation. And what we have here are um, knitted outlines of the, uh, the world. And then these connected layers, um, we have um, various dots connected by electric wires and electric fittings and audio fittings. Um, there is also an audio feature to this, which played on a 10 minute loop. And you can see the various threads coming down. And as someone who travels and sort of always got bored on the plane and looked through those airplane maps, seeing these lines reminds me of those um, flight connections, right? But it's also here, um, Kalat's talking about you know, borders and boundaries. We often see with her work, she's navigating conversations about political and social borders, thinking about where people are, where they're moving to, the connections we have around the world. And those connections can be both good and bad, right? They can be stabilizing and destabilizing, 
right? How people are connected together um, is really vast. And through those threads, you can be in the middle of nowhere in South America, but easily connected to Australia. And so it's this idea that as much as we are independent, you know, when I look at this piece and when I, you know, think about this installation, let's look at some details. You can see how these various threads are coming together and how they get tied, how some of these um, ties are created. If you look at this thread in blue um, and also a detail of the thread that connects into Australia, you can see that we have the appearance of what looks like also barbed wire. So some of these connections are also, you know, problematic and problematized. There's violence involved in borders and boundaries. There's violence involved in movement, right? Some movement is wonderful and some movement is desired while other movement, and we can think about um, uh, various features um, that are not desired, right? If we think about migrant labor and people needing to leave their homeland to go to another country to work, um, that's not always a desirable goal or outcome for some individuals. So there is some hardship here as well. And I think what makes this fascinating is, you know, trying to understand those connected threads. Now, this work was also shown again, it's been shown multiple times. Um, so that first installation I showed you was from 2011. This is another incarnation of this in 2016. And what we see then is a transition that the work is now titled Woven Chronicle. And I think for me, when artists return to a, a, the same work and reinstall a piece, it takes on a new life. Um, like all things in my own study of ancient art and architecture in South Asia, you know, these spaces are not fixed. They're not monolithic, they change. They change based on patrons, they change based on, based on, you know, the interaction of pilgrims and people in those spaces. And installations have that similar function. And when I'm looking at a contemporary installation, it also reminds me of my own study of ancient art and architecture where I'm looking at images installed in temples. Sometimes they change, sometimes they don't. But when we're thinking about this in a contemporary space, thinking about how the reinstallation of a work changes it, the addition and adornment of new objects, right? That additive process conveys new meanings. And what I love about this work and what I really love about um, Rena Kalat's work is the, this idea of um, navigating those changes. Um, people are not monolithic, cultures are not monolithic, works of art, are not necessarily monolithic. They change and the response to those pieces changes. And so seeing this installation at different stages and then looking at those further details um, is really insightful and gives you more things to ponder. And here in this detail that you can see, which is of North Africa, um, West Asia, and there's greater Saudi Arabia there in the middle and blue and South Asia, we have all these connected lines, but again, there's more layers here and more of that barbed wire technique in the tying of the threads that you know, creates, um, creates elements that remind us of the violence too, of migrations of people, right? Um, again, not because they want to, but we think about refugee communities, right? That are fleeing violence, that are fleeing climate disaster. Right? All of these elements are at work here. And it's a reminder that there's a complexity here that's not necessarily easy to untangle, but we all have to navigate this. Um, this is another work of Collapse called Cleft from 2017. Um, it's mixed media. So we have gauche, charcoal, ink, various electric wires on paper. And it's this really lovely, um, interesting perspective of the world. Um, and it's a diptych. Um, and so we have these two sheets in two spaces and we have this notion of separation, right? These divides. Um, a lot of what Kala is doing here in her work is talking about um, issues of hybridity and the hybrid. And I think this, this notion of the hybrid also comes in when we're talking about people moving um, and the diaspora, right? When you're from various places or you have 
um, a very diverse ethnic background or you have very diverse um, economic backgrounds, all of those elements, right? Both the seen and the unseen of diversity that make up for a very diverse group of, of peoples and populations are issues that have to be navigated. So if we look at cleft here, we have this really lovely, um, uh, almost fisheye view of this um, view of nature. We, we can see that the trees are actually in half and there's two um, sides to the tree. There's um, trees that have been woven together sort of in that sort of hybrid nation, uh, notion. If we look at the installation view, you can get a, a, a larger, better sense of the scale of this. And you can make out all of these details. This is not in miniature. So if you were to approach this, you would be able to read the various inscriptions layered into the form. But on the detail that I'm showing you on the right, you can see that here we have that hybrid um, hybridity playing out where we have the, the body and torso of a um, panda, but then the hindquarters and tail of lion. Um, again, you can see that barbed wire cutting through the form. And it's, you know, part of this is sort of building and modernizing on the bottom left corner in that installation view. You can see that there's cranes, right? There's building. There's somewhat of a destruction of nature while we're trying to coexist with nature. And in many ways, for me, this work is, is really talking about that natural state of things where um, both India in countries in the, the greater world are grappling with how to coexist, um, how to coexist harmoniously when indeed we are so interconnected and the boundaries that are established, which really are arbitrary, um, that form modern boundaries of countries and nations, of neighborhoods, of your yard even, um, they create divisions and divides. And some communities can overcome that, others can't. And so what I think is important to understand when we're looking at these works and we're thinking about what contemporary artists are doing in India to navigate those realities, um, it can help us globally understand where we're gonna um, approach these issues. Maybe we've never thought about them before, but how can we enter this conversation and how can we navigate these issues of hybridity and globalization, industrialization? And how do we do that in a way that's making the world um, more cohesive rather than divisive? Now, um, another major artist, uh, uh, Jadish Kalat, who is the husband of uh, Rina Kalat. Um, is probably one of the most well-known artists uh, working in the contemporary spheres of India today. Um, he was born in 1974 uh, in Mumbai. He lives and works in Mumbai today with his wife. Um, uh, and what we see then is this consciousness about social issues. So with Rina Kalat's work, we had a lot of very direct um, awareness of nature and form and these issues of boundaries. With uh, Jitish Kalat's work, there's more of a social consciousness that we see in the, in the works that I selected, um, a social consciousness um, about these issues and violence in a very direct way that is both um, pop in many ways um, and playful, but also very dark if we, if we think about um, the implications here. Now, what we're looking at on the slide here is Autosaurus tripodus from 2007. Now, this is a fabrication of a traditional Indian rickshaw. Right? Here's an example of a traditional Indian rickshaw that you'd see everywhere across South Asia. Um, fabricated, go back to the overview, fabricated out of resin, paint, steel, and brass. So it's an exact um, size and copy of an uh, auto rickshaw. But if we look closely at the details, this Autosaurus tripodus um, is a skeletal form made out of bones, um, claws, teeth. Uh, and what we have then is a rendering which is really grotesque. If we look at the back seat of this rickshaw, you can make out sort of the skin face of a form. Um, and this was made as in direct response to 
um, civil unrest and violence that took place in India in the early 2000s. In 2002, there were anti-Muslim riots um, that were devastating in India and Kalat made this work as a response to that. And we get this sense of um, his interpretation of you know, the riots and the um, destruction that was caused, several burned out cars and buildings um, in addition to um, murders and violence that we have this skeleton form here and these skeletal issues as part of um, the form. The form also takes um, various interpretations. So there were trucks interpreted and motorcycles interpreted. And this idea of these transport vehicles where we usually see large massive populations of individuals riding these vehicles or in these vehicles, right? Suffering such violence and damage um, that they really were associated with this sort of this death. And so it's this remembrance of this moment, but it's also considering sort of the, the greater activities um, going on and at work in terms of a popular object, an easily recognizable iconic object in terms of visual history uh, in India and in, in South Asia, but something that's been flipped, right? To get the viewer thinking about, you know, these notions of civil unrest and political unrest and violence. Now transportation for Kalat's work um, has been a, a reoccurring theme uh, in the exhibition. Um, we have uh, Petromorphine 3, uh, which dates to 2008, uh, again, made of cast resin. But we have this circular form that almost gives us a sense of like a wheel um, and or a wheel well. We have these protruding elements in the middle. And what we're seeing along this outer edge, which is a little difficult to make out, um, are actually renderings compiled renderings of different automobiles. And if we look at this next image, this is a painting, um, acrylic and gold pigment on canvas um, from 2005, which is a work that Collat did called Rickshawopolis. And we can see this sort of mass of ma amalgamation of different vehicles, buses, cars, transportation. Um, here's a Volkswagen camper van all of this sort of exploding out of the middle. It's these forms that we can see on the top here of the cast resin form. So this is a truck and a car um, and all of this mismatch of automotive vehicles, transportation vehicles, movement. And so to combine with that sort of circular form of the structure itself. So if we go back to the overview, you can see that circular form that gives us a sense of a wheel or even a melting wheel, because okay? we have the resin coming down at the end. Um, all of these elements are also highlighting these same recurring themes of movement and mobility and transportation um, from urban to rural, from India to the greater world, but that reoccurring sense of movement and migration and explosion of forms um, being played with here um, by Kalat that creates a really engaging work that makes you, you know, consider what we're looking at, why we're looking at that. The, the form itself is curious but it has this very industrial feel to it. And I think, you know, for a lot of these artists, we're, we're navigating conversations between um, the urban and the rural, the industrial and the organic. Um, because in many ways, if we look at, you know, the way I look at this, uh, all the vehicles around the form, it has this very sort of organic stacking to it as if it's emerging out of that form. And then the, the central element is so sharply, um, cast and clearly cast, it creates this juxtaposition between a very smooth surface and then a very rough mangled surface. And it has that visual interest and that curiosity that brings you in. Now the last artist we'll talk about um, also plays with these ideas of movement, migration, utilizes iconic visual forms in the works and utilizes um, various objects associated with 
uh, life in India and elevates it. And so we're talking about the artist Subodh Gupta here. Uh, he was born in 1964 uh, and he was born in the, um, a rural state called Bihar, which is in um, Eastern India. Now his early works, um, he was trained as a painter uh, and we see a lot of paintings in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, dealing with these same issues of migration. Again, like in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we have this very um, fixed sense of, of growth in India and expansion and a lot of movement to the cities and a lot of um, shifting um, in terms of India's place in the global world. And so these issues of showing the various trolley carts that you see here in the foreground, um, which are associated with the airport and the airlines, right? And people loading their goods on, on top of one of these Hindustani ambassadors again. You know, we're, we're dealing with where we're going and what's happening, but we're also really fixed on this idea of movement. Um, movement of people, movement of stuff, movement of places. And other paintings uh, from this time, and this is from 2003, 2004, start to focus on works that would be typical uh, that you would see in everyday life in India. Um, in, in addition to the Hindustani ambassadors loaded down with things, um, people taking taxis, um, this idea of, of bicycles, especially in rural India, um, bike transportation is, is sort of ubiquitous. You see it everywhere. Everything can be carried on a bike, anything. Um, and what you're looking at here are three bicycles loaded with um, milk containers for milk delivery. But Subodh Gupta has called this three cows. And in a sense, this is not incorrect, right? Um, this, these are vehicles delivering milk. Um, milk comes from cows. These are cows, right? So it's, it's, it's playing on this notion of, of identity and belief, and it's playing on the notion of, of um, what things are and what we call them. Around the same time, um, Gupta shifts, uh, oh, here's some examples of, of these milk jugs um, on the bicycles and you see this everywhere, right? Um, so we're taking like really mundane everyday scenes, everyday elements and elevating them. So from 2003 to 2008, this is a group of three cows. And here we actually have um, three bicycles which have been bronzed and chromed um, with these milk vessels. Uh, with varying dimensions, um, elevating the mundane bicycle and the mundane delivery system, and then creating these really dynamic um, objects that are focusing on, and for me, the, the, the power and the importance of these objects, right? The importance of a bicycle to somebody whose job is to deliver milk, it's vital, right? Um, these are humble objects. This is a humble job. Um, but Subodh Gupta is elevating it through the use of bronze and chrome to the importance it has for that community, for that individual. We see him do this as well at the same time um, with his basket of golden dung cakes. Now, dung cakes are traditionally used in India. They're, it's, it's cow dung that's been pressed with some straw and um, hand pressed and then set out to dry in the sun and collected. And here we have golden dung cakes, which seems absurd. However, the value of these dung cakes for both heating and cooking in rural India for rural communities um, can't be understated. And so when we're thinking about this, right, part of the, the background of Subodh Gupta and the things that you see across rural India when you drive anywhere or you take a train anywhere are seeing people preparing and collecting dung cakes. And so here's a photograph of a woman um, stacking dried dung cakes together. Here's another um, interpretation of that by Subodh Gupta and he calls this my mother and me. And what we have here in this installation from 2006 um, was a work that he initially did in 1997 where he takes um, cow dung cakes and ash and stacks them together to create a form, a house. And on the other side of this work, there's actually an entrance created. 
And when you enter, because we have this like three layers of, of dung cakes created, it's very quiet on the interior. This is a very intimate kind of installation in, in the fact that we're dealing with something that was probably done within families, right? That we have uh, a tangible impressions of hands on the outside of these dung cakes that you can see and also feel in terms of the texture. And it's, again, another elevation of something that's very humble to something that's making something um, uh, beyond natural. I don't wanna say this is supernatural. The word that's coming to me is supernatural, but that's not it. Um, but elevating the humble to something extraordinary. So extraordinary is a much better word. So when we're looking at these extraordinary objects, right? Um, the fact that the intrinsic nature of these objects is extraordinary, right? That they can fuel, they can heat, um, they're used in cooking. Um, but this is the, the job and duty to produce these of rural women. Um, and by Sabod Gupta calling this um, my mother and me, it's suggesting a connection he has to his home and his heritage and to his family through the making of these objects. Um, and so we have this connection back to that memory and then an elevation of that through the installation and through that work. And here's some other examples of, of cow, cow dung cakes drying and they'll have these fantastic sort of stacks as you look through, um, as you drive through spaces in rural India. And if you spend time in rural India um, away from the glitz and glamor of, of the city, you'll, you'll see these quite frequently. Now, another element that's very humble, that is probably most iconic um, in India, and now is iconic with Subodh Gupta's um, work, are stainless steel kitchenwares. Stainless steel kitchenware shops are found everywhere. Um, they're a very mundane, basic, everyday item. Um, plates, bowls, cups, spoons, everything. Um, they're virtually indestructible. Um, they don't tarnish. Uh, and you can find stainless steel cookingware everywhere in the shops and stalls across India. Now Subod Gupta takes these and elevates them. And so here we have his work from the 2005 Venice Biennale, uh, which he titles Hungry God. And he's made a skull, a giant one ton skull fabricated out of these stainless steel vessels. So he's taking those very mundane forms in creating a fabrication of works um, for this, one of the most famous um, uh, arts fairs in Europe. And so it becomes this point where the either the materials being elevated, the objects being elevated, um, but these iconic images and these iconic works still pay homage to um, uh, his heritage. Another installation from the same period uh, is called curry, and these are over life-size curry uh, shelves. Um, this would be like a typical kitchen uh, shelf setup for drying plates and dishes, um, but they're done on a monumental scale, so they're larger now. So we've gone sort of um, over life-size um, of the ridiculousness, and rather than just talking about stainless steel shelves, we're referencing now the, the things that um, are used, that these are used for, right? Curry, referring to food, referring to the making of food, the eating of food. And food in India is really a communal act, right? Families eat together, right? When we're taking a break, um, there's, there's usually a lot of engagement between the members of the family to make the food. So again, there's multiple layers here that you can unpack through both the size of the object, right? The scale that we're looking at and also in thinking about the materials. So I know we're running short on time, so let's do um, just a few more. The last works, the last few works that we're gonna talk about um, for Sabod Gupta include Terminal and then the untitled work uh, in the exhibition. All of these works that we're gonna talk about, the next two are again, using the same kinds of objects that are um, uh, typically um, found uh, in Indian homes. Uh, we have brass vessels here that have been stacked to create these large towers with string then tied together between the forms. Now the title here is terminal. 
Now for me, terminal, when I hear that term, I'm, I'm brought back to this idea of like a plane terminal, an airline terminal, um, where we have this um, movement of places and people. Uh, and like Rena Collot's work, with the, we have these strings and these strands connecting sort of the, the maps and places. Again, we go from one space to the, to the other here, um, from tower to tower, large tower, small towers, but they're still connected. They're entwined, right? Um, they're interconnected. And so, you know, we're grappling with people moving through these spaces. Um, for this installation, you were able to walk through these towers um, and navigate those spaces without getting tangled up. Um, and it's a reminder of that, you know, surrounding interconnectedness, right? That all of these things are woven together and they're fluid and they're growing and they're building. And sort of the, the way that this can be installed is various. Um, and then the, the stringing together of those spaces is up to the installers. Um, but it's very similar to sort of that movement of people and spaces across the globe and around the world and from communities um, to community, from neighborhood to neighborhood. So we have this reoccurring theme here. Now, the last work that I'll talk about is in the exhibition. Um, we have Subodh Gupta's um, untitled Sushi Conveyor Belt from 2008, which is a fantastic dynamic moving work made from again, cooking utensils. We have tiffins. Um, and so the details that you can see here, you can see these little boxes of brass. We have spoons of copper, vessels of copper and stainless steel. And what we're looking at are lunch tiffins, lunch boxes, um, stacked together in varying heights. Um, and when I look at this, right, I, I really get the sense of multiple towers and urban spaces and the movement of this. Right, this idea of moving through those physical spaces and having the objects move themselves reminds me of that constant flow and constant movement of people and spaces. Um, but you know, it's difficult to get a sense of this and sort of how iconic these objects are in India without having a, a better sense of, of the, the role that tiffins play in everyday society. Um, families making, uh, putting lunch tiffins together and sending that off um, with, the, with the members of the family when they go to, to work. Um, they're so iconic and they're so everyday. Um, everyone uses them. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO or you know, a, a shoe shiner. Generally, everyone in between uh, we'll be using these the same kind of objects. So when we see this installed then and moving around, um, it's an homage to that, these iconic forms, but also thinking about this new building contemporary India and an urban modernizing India with its skyscrapers and its buildings and people coming and moving in these cities and moving towards the cities. So it's this constant ebb and flow of people and spaces and so while I don't have any great answers as to sort of how we should read and understand uh, contemporary Indian art and how we should understand iconic forms, it's this thread of that iconic visual image um, and iconic visual imagery in India by contemporary artists that really challenges those monolithic stereotypes of an India of the past. Right? This is an India of the future. This is an India where cultural traditions are embraced, where modernity is embraced. Um, but there's an attempt by artists to navigate their place in this world and navigate their role as global artists in a global society and really helping to come up with sort of newer icons for this 21st century generation. So thank you for your time. Uh, I'm all done. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me and feel free to ask any questions on Facebook now, if you have them. Uh, hey everyone, this is Wilson Bay, Manager of Engagement um, over at uh, the CMA. And uh, we do invite you to um, ask questions um, if you do have any. Uh, we would definitely wanna thank Carrie for her time there today. Are any questions, thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you, if you do have any questions, please post them. Um, thank you, Carrie, again for, um, for agreeing to do this for us. It was a very, uh, very interesting lecture and um, we definitely enjoyed it. Um, we are a little uh, um, 
press for time, but if I do see a question come in, I'll ask it. Um, I'm a little curious, what, what uh, is your favorite piece in Visions from India? Uh, I, I heard the first, you said, what's my favorite piece? And then the last part of that broke out. Could you say? Oh, in Visions from India. Oh, in Visions of India? Um, probably uh, Sabod Gupta's sushi conveyor belt is my most favorite. Um, and I think I've always been fascinated by the stainless steel and those objects. And every time I would go and visit India and spend time in India, it's that tangible thing that I would hold in my hand and eat with every meal. And so it's this visceral reminder of being uh, at my, the where I resided in India and those spaces. And so it's this, the, the fact that you can transform those objects into these new urban things that, that are sort of have a life beyond their intention, but then take on new form and take on monumental form um, is really awesome. And I think because I'm not a scholar of contemporary art, I'm an appreciator of contemporary art and I'm really rooted in ancient traditions um, and ancient architecture, seeing how iconography can then translate itself in modern ways um, through these objects is really inspiring in terms of my own study and practice. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions come through at the moment, but um, I do wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone that we are um, open for holiday hours this uh, week. Uh, we are open on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, for regular hours, 10 to five. Um, and then we close out this exhibition next weekend on uh, January 10th, um, and we have a full day of uh, activities, so check out our website for that. Um, but um, yeah, I just wanna thank um, Dr. Brown one more time for joining us today, and uh, we really hope to see you guys soon here at the CMA, and Happy New Year. Thank you for the opportunity. Happy New Year, everyone.